Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, we're going to do a fast and loose watercolor landscape painting, focusing on mixing with phthalo blue. I'm going to prep my paper, and I'll talk about the materials. So if you want to hang out and listen to that, you can. If you want to skip ahead until I start painting, which will probably be in two minutes, feel free. So, uh, materials. A quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. 100% uh, cotton, 140 pound cold press. I thoroughly coat it with water, and this is to really get it saturated so I could really paint wet and wet. The house temperature is about 62 degrees right now, and I was looking up humidity earlier. I was on the phone with my Uncle Mike, and I think it's about 60% humidity kind of to give you an idea of maybe why my paper stays so wet compared to uh, some others it may also be just the quantity of water that is being put down maybe some people aren't going to that level just a lot of questions about that and I'd like to have you know help people find solutions for it now in my last video I put phthalo blue back into the palette. I originally added it in a few years ago when I was reading stuff by James Fletcher Watson. Now, James Fletcher Watson had utilized the ultramarine blue and the phthalo blue. I think at the time it was called Windsor blue when it was introduced. I think Windsor and Newton were the people that put it out on the market. Um, regardless, it's a very strong blue, and he would use it for more foreground colors while using ultramarine for more background stuff. I found, and I think what I interpreted from reading his stuff, is that reading, uh, painting the background with the ultramarine blue mixes gives your grays, and painting foreground with ultramarine uh, phthalo blue mixes gives you your greens and helps with a kind of atmospheric perspective in terms of color. So hopefully that makes some sense. So anyway, last video, I played around with that. I didn't achieve the super rich greens that I wanted. It was a little bit more on the moody side of painting, which is totally fine. It might be just a reflection on my painting in the, the past year or so. But I would like to, for the sake of the channel and for myself and experimenting, see if I can get the greens that I have achieved in the past. Lemon yellow may be one of the strong um, aspects to get that. Raw sienna from the tube may be another key. Uh, Miss, I think it's Miss Deborah. I'm not good with um, names, so I apologize. But if she's watching this, she'll know that I'm talking about her. Um, I had followed, followed along, and she had gotten the greens that I was talking about. And I think she had said that she was amazed that she was able to achieve them. She was, like, really happy with the greens that took place. So I think that's enough rambling. And I apologize for that, but kind of tying every video together, essentially. Nice and soaking wet, press down, flat the paper, use the back of the brush because we got oils on our hands that'll create areas of resist. Grab some raw sienna, and I'm gonna use this to map out my scene. Now, I love painting wet and wet. I think I stay in the wet and wet stage a lot longer than Ron Ranson and other um, watercolor painters did. I find that it really helps uh, just create a sense of unity throughout. When it dries, it gets a really nice soft effect. And then painting over it, dry brushing it, 
you can really get a sense of depth with the dry brushing over the softness. Scene wise, I'm really not sure. One of my other hobbies for exercising and having fun is uh, just longboarding. We don't have much hills in Louisiana, unless you go way up in North Louisiana, but I'm way down south. But there was a scene that I saw today that maybe I'll pull on. I did take out my phone and take some pictures, but this is some light red oxide that I'm putting in. I did take some pictures of the trees in an area, but I'm very weird where I'll take tons of photos of different things that I see and think that it'd be great reference material, but then I never wind up looking at it. But if you have a photo that you'd like me to paint from, and if I have your permission to film it and put it up on the channel, um, shoot me a message. And then you can email it to me. I've done that before and it's been a lot of fun. Painting from a photograph, I do go a little bit longer in the painting. Where today we'll probably spend about 40 minutes on this one. I'm going to grab some Payne's Gray. And if we were painting from a photo, it might be 40 minutes to an hour and 20, hour and a half. I'm going to hit the top part of my red, my light red oxide with this Payne's Gray. And as it gets closer, well, higher in the sky, I'm going to do larger masses. And the idea is to create a sense of it coming over us. All right, let's figure our far horizon, probably right about here. And I'll leave that sky the way it is. I've talked with others where it's very easy to overwork a sky. Um, I think it was Mr. Thomas that recently commented that he's been um, considering a sky a day practice or he started that endeavor. That's a very common art experiment. And I think a lot of people grow from it. I remember a few years ago, Lois Davidson had done that. Ron Ranson, there's a book on uh, skies where he adds a little bit more to his palette for painting skies. And I think Joe Menza has been playing around, here's paper towel, with a uh, gouache in the sky. Lift a little bit, get a little bit of texture. It's just using the paper towel. What I'm going to do is have a waterway. I'm going to grab some white, uh, some raw sienna. This will be my waterway in here, reflecting some of this light. I think I'll have some tall grouping of trees here. I'm going to grab some burnt sienna. This will be my land. So the area that this was inspired by is right behind a, um, a private school. Right now it's Easter break, so everybody's off from work and school. Uh, spring break, that's Passover still, and I think um, it's the month of Ramadan. Um, anyway, so there was like kind of a path, a road, where the parents would drive to pick up their kids. And I'll skateboard a little bit 
on that, just longboarding, practicing riding and pushing with my feet in the opposite direction. Um, I usually have my left foot in front, so this time it was the right foot in front. And it's like standing on a longboard for the first time. It's like using a new painting tool or a new palette or a new piece of paper for the first time. And I was kind of doing it back there because I probably looked like a newborn giraffe trying to stand up. But there is a path and I'm using, creating it with water, using Payne's Gray along the edge and a row of trees that were popping up and receding. I have some, done some um, film photography back there of these trees. And wet and wet, I have to kind of prepare my watery area for them. So anticipating the trees going dark and dark because they're going to have the shadow and the reflection. And in the wet and wet stage, it'll just look a lot nicer. You could probably do some squiggles with a uh, number one rigger later on. This will help right here. Our trees will come up here and mass up. And we'll seed. We'll put in a background tree line. On the left side, it was like an entrance to the school. And on the right side, we have the trees. This is far distant. So to lead the eye back here, maybe we'll try to put some variation back here to make the composition interesting. And somewhere back in here, we could have another tree just so it doesn't seem so desolate. Pushing some burnt sienna. We haven't used any fallow blue, and that's the whole point of this. So let's get some fallow blue on there now. Let's mix it with some raw sienna. We did all that without a blue. We did use the Payne's Gray, which has a blue in it. Modern mixtures of Payne's Gray are going to be your blue and a black. Uh, historically, I think Payne's Gray is probably late 1700s, early 1800s, an artist by the name of Payne, who painted, and he also gave lessons, and I don't know his first name, but you could Google him and, and see some of his works. Just accentuating our edges. Far background. Just trying to create some interest back in there. Our trees are going to come up. I'm going to anticipate them by putting in a little bit of wet and wet, and this will be foliage for those trees. This diffusion will soften up nicely, and we'll put more trees over it. Uh, sorry, more foliage over it when we dry get that depth. The base of the trees. I 
really feel like this edge is going to have to be accented. The thing with Payne's Gray and semi-quoting Ron Ranson is when he would put in the sky wet and wet in such large quantities, uh, people watching would gasp. But Payne's Gray has quite a tonal shift. It dries quite a bit. So practicing with your pigments, and honestly, one of the most important things, I think, is using a student grade, if you're doing fast and loose painting, or just beginning, and that's what I use, student grade, but quality student grade. Um, Cotman, uh, Van Gogh brand. I think, I don't know what um, Jerry's Artorama house brand is we're having a mixture of raw sienna and Payne's gray let me grab some phthalo blue grab some raw sienna oh where was I, I was blabbing about colors uh, pigments and brands if you use the student grade brands, you're going to be less likely to um, be hesitant to put uh, paint out and to use the paint. If you're just starting out and you want to paint fast and loose and you're using something expensive, if you're using your um, uh, Daniel Smith brands, you're gonna hold yourself back and be reluctant to use as much pigment. All right, this is the number one rigor. Uh, brand is Sil Silver Black Velvet. I had gotten into that brand when I had first started painting because of um, Rick S, who has fantastic YouTube tutorials on YouTube and a Facebook page. I think it's Friends of Rick S. And uh, people share their work and their techniques there. And I'll probably share this video there. Anyway, so Rick uses the Silver Black Velvet brand. And for the price, and the, the quality, it's, it's really, really great. If they're a little too expensive for you, um, I'm gonna grab a scraper that was made by YouTuber um, Mega, who comments down below, and he is super awesome. Uh, anyway, so Rick would use the silver black velvet, and this one is probably 12 to 16 dollars but if you can't find it or you don't want to spend that much um jerry's artorama has some buy it try it's where they're a dollar or two and i think one of them is uh the brand is mimic is the house brand m i c m i k i c i think so Check that out if that's the direction you want to go in if you're looking for a quality um, rigger brush. I think uh, Royal L, I'm just shortening things because I can't pronounce names. Uh, Royal has some sales on their brushes and they have various um, handles that are ergonomically made. So if you're looking for comfort, you can check those out as well. So I'm going wet and wet here. And you're going to see the diffusion take place. You're going to see what areas have dried. We can shape this edge here. Also throw in 
some grass right along that edge. My buddy Bill has a whole bunch of farmland and he just started raising uh, goats and cows. And there's a coolie right along his property. And the goats have finally started eating all of that, um, that grass. They would have to either mow or it would get overgrown. And it's a long stretch. It's amazing seeing how much the goats and the cows can munch and eat along fence lines and, uh, and, and I guess waterways. I think they even start making their own paths through the forest, through the trees on this property. I'm going to grab whatever's on the hake and pull in a little bit of low brush here. I usually frame the paintings uh, in the aspect of painting dark on the sides to draw the eye in and to stop the eyes from going off the edge. You'll find that you wind up using a very similar technique over and over again. Um, especially as YouTube painters, you'll see a consistency in our approach. And whether we do it subconsciously or, or not, you know, it's just our style coming out. And you'll eventually develop a taste for what you like. So you may like the application style but maybe you don't like my compositional approach. Uh, you might have something that you prefer. You may like Joe Menza's skies with, um, who, oh, let's find, um, Stephen Cronin's reflections. One thing that is a little rough though, um, is when you start out painting, if you're watching a lot of different YouTubers or just reading different books, uh, sometimes it could become overwhelming and you might shift from style to style. It's still wet right here. We can get really, like if we go nice and gentle in there, really cool distant trees. I'm brushing from the side. That's a technique that I picked up from Henry Lee, a Chinese brush painter. The side kind of swipe is a Chinese brush technique, I think called the X stroke. And I also saw it used by David Usher. And Alan Owen uses it as well. And he can do foreground trees with that side brush effect and just do absolutely beautiful trees. Just trying to cast a little bit of a shadow. Let's get some darker foreground foliage. I'm talking a lot this video. I had gotten, um, like I said, the long boarding in today and I mowed the backyard. I think in the last video I was complaining about having to mow the backyard. And I drank a delicious tea that I got from Etsy from uh, Liquid Proust or Prost, P R O U S T. And he had gotten it from Yeon Tea. And it was 2008 Taste of Hong Kong, which is a Puer tea, tea collected in Yunnan province, and then it was um, wet stored or stored in a humid environment, aka a basement in Hong Kong, 
and it was uh, very nice, very uh, forest floor tasting, which might not be some people's cup of tea. Very mossy, uh, with some floral aspects, kind of like a white tea, which I haven't really got too much of that from the puer, but it was really nice. Uh, you can see how it's drying some, and I'm getting a more textured effect now. Just a hint of stuff coming in. I blab about tea a lot, but up until the end of 2001, I was drinking a lot of energy drinks, which are no good. So I replaced that with tea. And that's been really nice. We haven't played with lemon yellow yet. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm mixing it into the already mixed area that I have. So this is gonna be kind of a conglomeration of all the pigments. Let's see if we could push it to a lighter green. Some Payne's gray, darken that edge. And what I'm doing with the hake brush, you can do with a rigger, you can do with a um, a flat brush. Whatever works for you. These are Payne's gray here. I think what I'll do this time is kind of scrape where the light would be coming through. Once again, just kind of hitting that edge of this side. Joe Menza has joked that I have three stages, the wet and wet, the first pass, and then the second pass. It's interesting because he has that outside perspective and can see something about me that I can't see. So it's nice to talk to other artists and to watch other artists and, and kind of really try to get down to the root of what they're doing and their approach. You know, for me, it's um, texture and kind of tonal values. Um, I'm not trying to lump myself in with Stuart Davies, my hero, but I'll say that uh, Stuart Davies is kind of the same texture and um, tonal values. I just use the Payne's gray as a makeshift dark. There's some lemon yellow. I don't think I've said this yet, but you are more than welcome to follow along 
anything you do when you follow along. You can sign your own name to it. I would love to see your results. Feel free to tag me or share it with me on social media. I have a whole bunch of links below. You have my express permission to sell anything you do whenever you follow one of my tutorials. I want you all to succeed and have fun. If you want to support this channel, I have a whole bunch of different ways down below. And that goes towards art supplies and other stuff. Yeah, Hammy. Hammy says, like and subscribe. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can't hop up yet, bud. Let me pause and do a dry off so we can see how things look, and then we'll see if we need to um, accentuate anything. All right, so that was the first dry off. It still is a little damp, but I will say this. The tonal shift that took place was a very pleasing one. It really didn't wash things out, and I felt like it helped it come more alive. Um, that being said, uh, while I dry off, I look at like what I want to do and where to go in the next stage and we're 30 minutes in, so we won't go too much, but I'm mixing up strong thallow blue with, excuse me, burnt umber. We haven't used burnt umber at all this painting and we will kind of accentuate, do some foreground elements, maybe splatter, and just bring some areas alive. You can omit this stage if you like. You can experiment with just using uh, Payne's Gray at this stage. You can play with um, black and see what works for you what you want to use to accentuate. I'm using the number one rigger, which I feel I can get very calligraphy type strokes, very jagged type marks with it, um, just expressive marks. And you can see that I'm very loosely letting it flow around. The best way to reference this is there's a uh, TV show, American Dad, a cartoon, American uh, adult comedy, where the son gets what he thinks is a wand, and he says it's so light, I can't tell if it's leading me or I'm leading it. And I think... That's kind of um, the approach. Just just let it jump around. Let it dance on the paper. And we'll grab this dark. And we'll pull it up into the tree. The closest one. We'll play around with it. I mentioned the coolie by my buddy's house the other day, uh, early in the video. I had taken some pictures as the sun was setting. In the distance, there was trees on either side and just a uh, very strong dark on the underside of the tree in the distance. And I thought that's a great example of a dark tonal value distant in the, um, the picture plane. So Hopefully one day I can get around to that because I use dark values in the foreground as kind of, you know, just the trick, just my fast and loose approach for creating depth that I would like to play in reverse and see if I can do that. So in the interest of time for YouTube, 
I am going to dry this off in a moment and we'll sign it and see how it looks. And then from there, I will end the video. So I hope you enjoyed. And um, I'm excited to see what you all paint. Put some birds. There you go. All right, I'm going to pause this and we'll do a dry off. And there you go. There's the finished painting. The um, phthalo blue and the burnt umber mixes for a amazing dark. So if you're struggling for darks, uh, play around with that and see what you can get. Um, Traditionally, people will mix their um, burnt sienna and ultramarine, or burnt sienna, and you can mix it with the, um, yeah, burnt sienna, ultramarine, burnt umber, ultramarine, you can get some darks there. All right, thanks for watching. You all have a great day. Take care.